Welcome everyone to the US Asia Law Institute's Asia Law Weekly webinar. I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the Institute, and we're very glad to be back after a long holiday pause. We've got a great uh, lineup of speakers this semester, and the talks are going to continue to be on Wednesdays. So our speaker today is Michael Davis, and I think for anyone who's been following closely the discussion in recent years about human rights in Hong Kong, um, free speech, democracy, and so on, we'll be familiar with that name. Um, Michael is a law professor who teaches about international human rights, uh, has taught in Hong Kong for about 30 years, most recently at the University of Hong Kong. And there's a great deal more to his scholarly biography, uh, which you can read on our website. But I want to highlight another interesting side to his biography, which is as a human rights uh, activist. Um, he's a member of the advisory board of the Hong Kong Democracy Council based in Washington, DC. He was a founder of the Article 23 Concern Group in Hong Kong in 2003, which campaigned against Hong Kong's early moves to draft national security legislation. And he frequently writes commentary in newspapers to the extent that the Hong Kong for Foreign Correspondence Club gave him a Human Rights Press Award in 2014 for his commentaries in the South China Morning Post. Now the book he has just published, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, Making Hong Kong China, is I am going to say less an academic book and more a, a work of advocacy, but of course, Michael, you can correct me if you disagree with that, um, and I don't describe it that way as a criticism. Um, we published a short excerpt from the introduction to the book on our website as a USALI Perspectives essay back in November. So Michael, I wanna turn it over to you to tell us a bit about the book, why you wrote the book, and perhaps you can push back on what I just said about it as a work of advocacy as much or more than uh, an academic work. Thank you, um, Catherine. I, uh... I, that's fine. I can characterize as long as I get readers, I can go any way it wants. Uh, I, I think what I do, I think the first chapter especially uh, lays that out. I mean, I think as a professor of human rights, just about everything I write is advocacy. So that that's just comes with the, the subject matter. I think no one writes on human rights unless they have something to say about how things would be improved and so on. And so what I tried to do with the book, though, is to write it in a readable fashion. I didn't want it to be just, you know, the standard sort of law journal style of writing, but rather to tell a story about Hong Kong that readers who are academics, I think some chapters are, are more academic, uh, getting into, you know, the nitty gritty of, of the new national security law, which we'll talk about today. Uh, discussing uh, the kinds of rights implications of the protest that took place in 2019 and so on, and, and even backgrounding the constitutional system. So that's all there. But I wanted to keep, uh, keep it high on the readability level for readers, not just academics, and for uh, policymakers and so on. Uh, because obviously, I, I sat down and wrote the book for the very purpose of making uh, these things available to people. And that's why I'm speaking here today. Uh, if I, should I go forward now, Catherine? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, I think one part of it, uh, the, the most important part is, is, as you say, a kind of highlighting the problems that Hong Kong faces and trying to help people to understand those. But I think it's also important in this age when, you know, people, prominent academics like Larry Diamond and others, are pointing to a crisis of democracy around the world where authoritarianism uh, threatens democracy. Uh, in some ways, I think the, the Hong Kong story offers like a roadmap on how an authoritarian regime can undermine a liberal rule of law based constitutional system. So that, that is, is, is really interesting. In the work I do, I work across the, mostly across Asia on human rights and development uh, and authoritarian populist leaders uh, and so on uh, often engage in a lot of the same activities of, of posing threats to various institutions that are important uh, in a liberal constitutional system. So that for the, to that extent, I think the book could be instructive even for persons perhaps whose work doesn't much connect with Hong Kong. 
uh, in, 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 in the book, I, I lay out at first why I call Hong Kong a liberal constitutional system. And there, basically, if you look at the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984, and then the basic law, which implemented it, and the basic law is written by China, you really have all the elements of a liberal constitutional system. Now, Chinese leaders are fond of saying uh, that there's no separation of powers in Hong Kong, and it's executive-led. But the, the second part of that statement in some ways contradicts the first part because if it's executive led, that's why it needs a separation of powers. It needs other branches of governments to check the executive and the exercise of power. And that's all in the, in the basic law. The surprising thing is, is how well it, it includes all of that. It includes a guarantee of a high degree of autonomy, which was necessary for Hong Kong because Hong Kong uh, is sort of, it's kind of, I think Berlin, you know, Hong Kong is sort of like Berlin, surrounded as Berlin was during the Cold War uh, by an alternative regime. So the autonomy of, of the community was very important. And Chinese leaders knew that, they knew this. They, they stressed to Hong Kong people that they keep their uh, hearts at ease and not worry. They told this to international investors. Uh, they went to capitals of the world to assure people and so on. So even today, when we think of these accusations of foreign interference in Hong Kong, it's important to realize that China asked foreigners to recognize and uphold the Hong Kong system. So when foreign governments respond to, to threats to that system, uh, it shouldn't really be viewed as antagonistic, but rather supportive of the Hong Kong model that China created. That model guaranteed a common law system to main, be maintained, the rule of law, uh, human rights, including the, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was to apply in Hong Kong and the courts, <coughs> excuse me, were to be independent and final. Now in the book, in the second chapter, I kind of highlight where I think two areas where I thought the basic law uh, was deficient. One was, in giving Beijing absolute control over interpretation. Usually an autonomy model works best if the central government and the regional government sort of share, uh, perhaps in a constitutional committee or a court. I wrote a book advocating that years ago called Constitutional Confrontation in Hong Kong before the basic law was drafted, suggesting that. But instead of that, they created a basic law committee that's totally subordinate to Beijing. And so no one really knows what that committee does. It's supposed to advise the National People's Congress in interpreting the basic law. But basically the impression we have is the National People's Congress Standing Committee tells the basic law committee what it's gonna do and they rubber stamp it. <clears throat> so that, that kind of a check uh, on the central government's power doesn't exist. And the other area which was thought very important to Hong Kong was a guarantee that Hong Kong, uh, the ultimate aim would be universal suffrage in Hong Kong, that democracy in Hong Kong would matter for Hong Kong to maintain its autonomy. Okay, uh, And the people of Hong Kong have come to know these two things. They know the independence and finality of the court. courts matter a great deal, but they understand, and that's why they often take to the street protesting over democracy. They came to understand that having a government in Hong Kong that's responsive to Hong Kong people and not just the central government as appears now to be the case. Uh, the chief executive of Hong Kong is essentially selected by a, a very pro-Beijing committee now and rubber stamp, the selection is rubber stamped by Beijing. And so the central, the, the Hong Kong government is very beholden to the central government. And Hong Kong people over the years have worried more and more about increasing Beijing intervention in Hong Kong. Okay, so the story that we have now today of the national security law being a dramatic uh, intrusion into Hong Kong didn't begin there. It began over the years where Beijing used this power of interpretation and kept dragging its feet over democratic reform to maintain control over Hong Kong and to keep the Hong Kong chief executives and their government very much subordinate to Beijing. Instead of representing Hong Kong, I think the local perception of ordinary people is they represent, that government represents Beijing and, and fails to speak up for Hong Kong. And that is what causes and drives the problems with street protest in Hong Kong. The street protest in effect 
uh, signals a society that understands that if Hong Kong's autonomy is to be guarded, it's going to be guarded from the street, that the government's not up to the task and the power of interpretation. There's no guardian, there's no uh, guardrail between the central government and the local autonomous region. So these problems are very much built into it. And so the for the government in Beijing and or the Hong Kong government to complain about pr protest in some ways comes off a bit rich to people in Hong Kong because you know you've created the very conditions that are driving the protest and yet uh, when we see these protests we keep hoping the central government will pay attention. In 2019 uh, this came to a head and, and it was very a big crisis as we all know, we all watched in the news as Hong Kong protests went on. In uh, there's a chapter in the book. I, I came to, I went to Hong Kong in December uh, near the end of those protests and interviewed people and so on. So there's a chapter in the book highlighting what people thought was going on when they engaged in these protests and what they were seeking. They made five demands and so on. I don't have time today to talk about that, but it's just those protests in effect created the thing I do want to talk about, which is the new national security law being imposed on Hong Kong. Okay, So that th those protests on the one hand are Hong Kong people demanding the very things I've been talking about here. And on the other, they were viewed by Beijing and establishment figures as an insurrection. That's something they had to crack down on, they had to bring an end to. And so some of our listeners will, will, will think perhaps, well, of course, they had to do something because things got out of hand on the streets of Hong Kong. Uh, but I think to understand this, one has to go deeper, and I won't go too far into it now, but just to note that, you know, Hong Kong people were asking for things that really were in the basic law itself. And so one way out of the problem of 2019 is to crack down and use heavy police force, which we saw. But the other way out would have been to listen to the people of Hong Kong and to try to, to respond to their five demands, which were either telling the government that they wanted this uh, police behavior investigated, uh, or they don't want to be accused of rioting because they're demanding what's, what they're entitled to in the basic law. Uh, and uh, they started out, uh, uh, listeners may not know, they started out opposing an extradition law, which would have seen Hong Kongers prosecuted on the mainland uh, for mainland crimes, which really deeply offends the idea of, of, of autonomy that the Hong Kong government would be sending people across the border to the mainland. Uh, and the mainland uh, rights regime is not much trusted. So that, that's the kind of reaction. One side seeing an insurrection, the other side demanding what they, they were promised. Uh, and uh, their demands, they only got one of them. The, the extradition law was withdrawn, but we know that didn't mean much because a year later, the national security law accomplishes uh, a similar kind of intrusion on the Hong Kong legal system. So, so that was it. Then we get the national security law in 2020. Uh, and that's kind of where Hong Kong is now. And that's sort of viewed as the biggest threat. It has brought silence to the streets because people are all being arrested. Uh, and I can't go into it in great detail here because we want to get to discussion. But basically what it does is, is it completely undermines the autonomy of Hong Kong by first creating a committee on safeguarding national security headed by the chief executive, but subordinate to the central government. Uh, and that committee uh, is to impose this national security law. And, and it's advised by a, 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 a national security advisor who's a mainland official. But because the committee is subordinate to the central government and this mainland official represents the central government, even though the committee is chaired by the chief executive, people generally view it as, as being controlled uh, by this uh, mainland official, the central government. And in effect, the central government now directly intruding into Hong Kong on, on in every area they consider involved to involve national security. And as we've seen in the arrests that have taken place, just basically any opposition to the government seems to be viewed as a national security threat. Uh, and, and, and so that's one thing, but it didn't stop there. They created an office for safeguarding national security. And this is made up entirely of mainland officials and based in Hong Kong. And they also go around and investigate national security. The local police were ordered to, under the law to create a special unit uh, 
on national security and so is the uh, Department of Justice, a special unit. The police unit operates in secret. It in effect becomes a secret police in Hong Kong. Uh, the first act of the committee was to create a whole regulation regime which would allow warrantless searches and all sorts of things that offend human rights, uh, surveillance, secret surveillance and everything. That, and the law specifies create to create a list of judges who can hear it. So they want to eliminate any judges who cannot hear it. So a special list of judges, okay? Uh, and so this uh, means that in effect, uh, and, and I should add here as a footnote that the committee itself specifically is not subject to constitutional review, to legislative review. Uh, and so its control over us kind of secret police means uh, that uh, when someone shows up in court, we don't know what kind of rights would be violated in the process of arresting and charging them. Okay, And whether those things are subject to review at all, it's hard to say. And then the, the office itself is not even subject to local jurisdiction. So it imports a bunch of mainland security officials who are not uh, even subject to local jurisdiction. They're supposed to adhere to Hong Kong laws, but in the performance of their duties, the courts in Hong Kong have no jurisdiction over them at all. And again, they can conduct investigations or recommend investigations or you know, carry them on themselves. And that, that office has even more power in that if it judges a case as complex, it can actually uh, transfer it to mainland courts. And so the defendant uh, could be uh, tried on the mainland in the mainland legal system. So this is a kind of summary of it. The law itself includes crimes of secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces. Uh, and these are all vaguely defined. So it, it's bad enough that it's not normal processes anymore in Hong Kong, but that the laws themselves that are to be applied through these extraordinary processes are vaguely defined so much so they talk about abetting, aiding and so on, uh, that one doesn't really quite know what is prohibited and what is not. And this has become a real problem. Uh, and so we are sitting around waiting to see who gets it's arrested, I guess, to figure out what is, is allowed and what is not. So this is a, a very uh, brief summary of the law. We can discuss it more. I just wanted to highlight, if I have a, a minute or two more, to highlight that there's been a whole series of arrests on the first day of the law. The law was issued, by the way, uh, secretly. It was drafted secretly. There was no public consultation. It was promulgated at 11 p.m. on June 30th and went into force on July 1st last, uh, last year. Uh, it, uh, the first day there were 10 arrests under that. There were 360 arrests under other public order laws about unauthorized assembly and so on, but 10 arrests under the national security law. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> very much at the beginning, I'm now just highlighting some of the first six months. Uh, at the beginning, the, government, the, the uh, opposition camp was holding a primary election uh, so that they could narrow down their candidates. And then they were going to uh, uh, have the voters help them to choose candidates that have best chance of winning. They wanted that to win 35 seats out of the 70 seats so that they could block government actions or block the government budget. Uh, some of the organizers had the idea that if they could block the budget twice, then the chief executive would have to resign. Okay, so immediately the organizer of that, my former colleague at Hong Kong University, Benny Tai, was accused of subversion, that the primary itself, holding a primary election is subversive. But it got much worse, many months later, uh, all of the participants in the primary were arrested under the national security law, being 53 of them. Uh, and so this action of holding a primary election, which of course is very familiar to Americans, uh, is, has become criminal. The, the charges have not been leveled yet. It's still under investigation. Uh, one of the things that comes up is whether people will be granted bail. The national security law creates a kind of presumption against bail, okay? 
So in this case, the people were, the, the arrestees were given police bail. So that, that's not yet in the court, whether they will be given bail when they're charged, we don't know yet. So th this is one of the problems. Uh, other things that happened right after the law was enacted, 12 opposition candidates were disqualified from running in the legislative council election. Uh, and uh, they, uh, four of these were existing legislators. Uh, and basically their crime was opposing the national security law. And so they were disqualified. Uh, and then right after that, the government decided to delay the election entirely for another year, saying that, that due to COVID, they couldn't hold elections. Americans, of course, know better, but uh, nonetheless, that, that was the, the result. And initial, so then they had to extend the legislative council for a year uh, and they did this. Uh, just Beijing authorized it, and, and everyone was to stay in the Legislative Council. A couple of pan-Democrats, uh, opposition figures resigned because of the delay, but the four that we're talking about stayed in, but then Beijing later declared the government could dismiss them. And when the government then did that, it dismissed these four legislators, all the opposition legislators resigned. So now the Legislative Council of Hong Kong is completely a talk shop in support of the government. Interestingly, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, praised the new legislative council, said now it's very conducive to getting things done because no one opposes her, I guess. So these, these are, are some examples of what happened. There were arrests. Uh, one of the things that happens is the arrest now under the national security law and arrest for other prior existing laws like unauthorized assembly seem to come together in many ways so that someone could be arrested, like a Tong Ying Kit was arrested uh, under the national security law, uh, and he's denied bail. Another guy, uh, let me see if I can get his name here, Tam, oh yeah, Tam Tak Chi was arrested under the national security law, but they switched his charge to sedition. So they kind of freely go between them, and then the lawyers prosecuting him said that he should only be tried by the judges on the list. Okay, so these are our examples. Uh, one of the most notorious cases was Jimmy Lai's arrest. He's a publisher of the most prominent newspaper in, in Chinese in Hong Kong. Uh, and he's being charged with a, a variety of national security crimes, subversion, collusion, and even charging him with fraud because of some real estate problem, landlord tenant problem he has, they, they've turned into a, a crime. And he was initially denied bail and then he appealed his bail decision and the high court let him off, let him on bail, let him have bail. And at Christmas, he was home. And then Beijing started condemning it, saying Jimmy Lai for speaking on things, all his charged, things he's charged with are all speaking. Uh, is a danger to society, a dangerous person. Uh, and then the government appealed the high court's uh, denial of bail to the court of final appeal. And the court of final appeal has put him back in jail pending the hearing of that case on February 1st. So we're gonna get an interpretation of this presumption against bail. I mean, these are just some of the things that have gone up and I know I've taken too much time and I can open this up for discussion. I'm just kind of looking through uh, some notes here. One of the things I think that's real important is that the judges are now coming under attack all the time. If they release somebody because the prosecution has failed to produce a sufficient case, whether it's a, a public order case, uh, you know, under the existing laws or the national security case where maybe a judge has granted bail, and, and then uh, the, the Beijing newspapers and Beijing officials will start attacking the judges by name. And so the courts are now under severe pressure. And so I can close with this thought. The chief executive in this autonomous region was always under Beijing's thumb. Before about half or two thirds of the legislature were pretty much under Beijing's thumb, but there was some opposition there. That's gone now. The newspapers have long been under pressure, but now they're under more pressure under the national security law. Education sector is under pressure, uh, both at the secondary level where teachers are uh, 
fired if they teach things that Beijing doesn't like about Chinese history or China's role and so on and so forth. Uh, students who post up things that are critical of the government could be suspended. At the university level, the same kind of pressures occur. So there's a kind of intimidation of faculty. Of course, Benny Tai, I mentioned, was fired. So all of these institutions, even the banks, are put under pressure to support the national security law. There was a hearing just today in London uh, with HSBC asking why uh, they uh, were seizing or freezing the bank accounts of activists. And they say, well, they're just following Beijing's requirement, the law's requirement. So, so all these institutions, and the last kind of institution to safeguard Hong Kong is the courts. And now they're under severe pressure. So all of this, this story, and, and there's many examples we can draw on, but I think I'll just close it now because I think I have run over the time a bit, but I've tried to, it's a very complicated story. It reminds me when I was a student, I was asking an essay to write an essay on the rise, the conduct of, and the fall of the Roman Empire. It was really a tough time in one essay. So in some ways tried to tell this story, which keeps getting more complicated every day, it has been very challenging in the short time here, but I'm open for discussion. Thank you very much for that. There's, there, there is quite a bit to talk about. We certainly won't cover it all exhaustively, but you've really teed up a lot of the, the key points. Um, the idea that from the get-go, the structure that was created for Hong Kong governance post-1997 was, um, was not necessarily an entirely solid <laughs> one. Yeah. It was a political compromise. There were problems that we could anticipate, and there, it was a question of goodwill, politics, all kinds of other factors coming into play that allowed it to be sustained for as long as it uh, sort of sustained, but over time it has sort of staggered and the, 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 the nuts and bolts have been under pressure all along and it started to collapse from its own internal inconsistencies, we could say. Um, uh, you've talked a lot about what's happened just in the last few months, the, the pressures leading up to it, and then of course, the one point that I'm gonna just sort of park for us to get to later, this question of what's happening out of sight. You know, you mentioned the bank, so I'd like us to get back to that because I think sometimes we focus just on the arrests for obvious reasons, but then there are these other things happening out of sight where uh, pressure is quietly being exerted and, and, and things are shifting in the, in the overall dynamic. But just to, to go back and dig in a little bit to what is the structure? What is the regime we're looking at here? Um, I wanted to ask, even before the national security law took effect, just all of these years since 1987, since the return to Chinese rule, what has been the regime? Is there any regime for ensuring enforcement of international human rights laws that Hong Kong had signed onto? Um, and I'm thinking of, of course, there's the courts. But was there, has there ever been any other kind of a mechanism in Hong Kong uh, that uh, monitored Hong Kong's compliance with international human rights law and uh, perhaps blew a whistle if there was seen to be a shortcoming? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, question, Catherine. Yeah, of course, that's exactly right. The ICCPR, Hong Kong is a party to the ICCPR and the ICSCR, uh, CEDAW, uh, virtually all of the major uh, international human rights treaties. Uh, and there are these reporting processes. They even extend to reporting on Hong Kong under the Human Rights Council. Uh, so, uh, you know, the periodic reviews. Uh, and these- Separate, you know, separate from mainland. Yeah, yeah, Hong Kong is always hived out. In fact, when it comes to the ICCPR, uh, the mainland is not a party. The mainland has signed the ICCPR, but not ratified it. So Hong Kong is separately uh, and this was part of the joint declaration and the basic law guarantee that Hong Kong would continue under these treaties. And in fact, interestingly, the ICCPR was essentially photo photocopied and became the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. And this was done right after 1989 uh, by the British. And there was a big question whether that ordinance would survive the handover because there was a review of laws at the time and some were cast off. 
Uh, but a lot of the colonial laws, those, those that China did not object to remained. Uh, and so uh, this photograph of the ICCPR, I may be one of the rare cases in the world where the ICCPR text is the Hong local Bill of Rights Ordinance. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so the courts in Hong Kong under Article 39 of the Basic Law, uh, the, this guarantee of the ICCPR is provided that, that laws in Hong Kong cannot be passed that mm -hmm. violate the international human rights covenants or certain labor or guarantees. And the courts took that seriously from the get-go after the handover, they would enforce uh, that. In fact, what they did is they elevated the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance, e.g. The, the IE, excuse me, the ICCPR, they elevated it to a constitutional level and because of that Article 39 guarantee. So these things are uh, applied in the courts uh, and they impose international standards. They're very good at using comparative constitutional law, uh, horizontal dimension and enforcing it and also looking at uh, uh, decisions of uh, the Human Rights Committee uh, they even look at European, uh, under the European Convention cases uh, on human rights. So, so that is done in the courts. The, the committees themselves, as you know, they just issue their statements. They're not really strictly enforceable. Uh, they get reported in the media, uh, probably better in Hong Kong than they would in mainland China, where only the first few sentences are reported, praising China's efforts, but not so much uh, the details. So things like caged home dwellings, and stuff, uh, housing you know, problems and so on are even uh, publicized. Uh, how much the government responds to it is as, as the case is everywhere, depends on whether the, whether the government wants to do so. But mm. it does create and always has created a vehicle for public activism, for people to protest and so on. Nowadays, we don't know with a national mm. security law how, uh, how effective these things will be because the collusion uh, uh, prohibition in the national security law, the crime of collusion with foreign forces uh, includes uh, an effort by someone to seek sanctions from a foreign government or international body. So an advocate before these committees now, and they go testify, may face problems. There may be some caution that you could be charged with collusion, uh, especially the ones who testify before the House of Parliament or US Congress or some, some body like the European Parliament to try to get uh, pressure on China uh, to uphold these rights guarantees. So it's very well, dicey now. Yeah, now I know that there's been that concern about people who did come and talk to members of Congress, as you say, you know, the British parliament, but is there, serious, are, is there a serious argument that someone who went to Geneva and um, either developed a shadow report, for example, yeah. Uh, for a universal review process or for any of the other treaty bodies. Uh, if, if a Hong Kong activist, lawyer, NGO wrote a shadow report about you know, the torture convention or something along those lines, is there a serious argument that that could constitute collusion with foreign forces to seek sanctions? I, that seems qualitatively rather different from a, an arguably political act of going to Congress and, and making an argument. Well, we haven't had it tested yet because the law is new. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine if I was uh, advising an NGO that might want to, to testify or create such a report, uh, probably they might want to, and, and I would hope this would not have to be the case, but a cautious approach would probably be to criticize the human rights violations, but be cautious about advocating uh, any right. kind uh, sanctions or pressure on China as a result of that violation. Uh, mm -hmm. We just don't know that this is the problem with the vagueness of, of mm -hmm. this law that no one knows. Uh, we know a lot of Hong Kong activists have fled into exile and they're testifying in the, before the European Parliament and other places and, and governments but we know those cases, they are already warrants on their arrest. So we don't know where the boundary is. That's the, one of the major problems with these uh, crimes now under the national security law, because China views almost all opposition as a threat to national security. And when they arrest 53 legislators for just holding a primary, 
then mm-hmm. you figure that this is that means the the breadth of what is prohibited is 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 extraordinary. It's quite broad, yeah. In the um, in the pre national security law time, w- when you described the Hong Kong courts enforcing uh, or uh, having reference to the international human rights law and therefore attempting to enforce it, are there any instances where um, their decisions forced the Hong Kong government and therefore in a, indirectly Beijing to accept um, the force of international law to change how, some ordering in Hong Kong, whether it had to do with, as you, you mentioned, the caged men and uh, right to housing and some of these other social rights as well as political rights. Are there instances in which it became accepted even during the period of Chinese sovereignty that yes, international law bites, it matters, it makes a difference, it forces us to change what we do here in Hong Kong? Oh, yes. I mean, um, the courts, the, court, the ordinary courts, but also the Court of Final Appeal uh, regularly issued interpretations when people, uh, as in the U.S., if you challenge, uh, you know, some law or government practice as violating basic rights, uh, because the Bill of Rights Ordinance itself is the ICCPR, uh, the, the government, uh, the, the, the plaintiff would be invoking uh, those guarantees. Uh, and if this goes to the whatever level of courts, then the court would have to rule on it. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the general pr- rule would be they then the government would comply if that was the case. So and they you, have complied. Yeah, they would comply. They would. The, the case that comes to mind, there's probably so many of them, but one was where uh, admission to schools, mm-hmm. uh, they, they were kind of girls were doing better on the admissions test to secondary schools uh, and getting too many spots. So then the government was trying to put its fingers on the scale so that it would even out and and that was challenged. Uh, And and that involves CEDAW and and the practice, the laws, local enforcement in Hong Kong requires that the law be locally enacted. An international treaty is not directly enforceable. Mm -hmm. So the, the local laws on equal protection were used then, and, and this um, putting the finger on the scale had to stop. So, mm-hmm. so there, there would be other, just any kind of rights, basically, uh, mm-hmm. because the guarantee in the basic law and the guarantee internationally because of the use of the ICCPR would be the same. It's mm-hmm. the same thing. And so the court right. would consult uh, cases in mostly in common law jurisdictions, but occasionally in the European uh, cases as well, for the European Court of Human Rights. So they, they, they ju- these are not binding because they're outside the jurisdiction, but they can be persuasive and they can be used for right. what the court called a purposive approach to enforcement of human rights. Right, so this is what Hong Kong courts are used to doing. They know how to draw on international human rights standards. They know how to apply them. And this has been part of the architecture of law then accepted for so long. So now that we come into this new period with the national security law, I'm wondering how does that change what you were just talking about, uh, this almost automatic kind of reference to international human rights law as being applicable in Hong Kong courts, knowing how to refer to it, how to apply it, and, and Hong Kong executive agencies knowing how to listen to them and comply. Now that we have the national security law how does that change this enforcement mechanism? Does the national security law trump the basic law and the Bill of Human Rights? Is it at the same level? I've seen some some d- d- discussions about this. I know this is something you talk about in your book. Um, you know how you determine what trumps what um, when they con- conflict. Um, some people have said, well, Hong Kong courts are very sophisticated they know how to try to resolve conflicts of law. Um, what is your analysis of, of what happens here? Well, my, my thought is, and I argue this in the book, that effectively the national security law trumps the basic law. Mm-hmm. And I use the mainland law for this argument because both the national security law and the Hong Kong basic law are national laws of China. They're enacted by the National People's Congress. 
And under China's legislation law, I think it's Article 85, uh, they, the view is that, as it is in the common law tradition itself, uh, the view is that when two statutes conflict, the last enacted uh, or the more, and the more specific one governs uh, a more general one that was previously enacted. So in that argument, the basic law where national the boundary between national security and free speech uh, are involved, which is what this law uh, raises, uh, then the national security law is the last enacted and it's more specific. So mm. presumably it would be binding. Now the national security law itself in article four says that human rights protections will continue and right. so on and so forth. So, uh, and the ICCPR applies, uh, <clears throat> but the problem is and, the structure. Sorry, and also the the uh, basic law was was enacted pursuant to uh, an international treaty. So the argument is made that that would elevate it slightly, so that it's not actually at the same level as the national security law. That would could be made. Uh, China takes the view that that international treaty, uh, it's actually said so a couple of times that it no longer applies. That that it's been fulfilled. Uh, but that is actually, I've argued in, in various writings, that that, that violates the, the basic law itself because, uh, I mean, the, the treaty itself, excuse me, because Article 7 says the treaty carries on for 50 years and that both parties are bound to try to uphold the requirements of the treaty for 50 years. Uh, that is not just handing over Hong Kong and it's done. Uh, mm -hmm. But China tries to use sovereignty as, as a pushback that you know, this was just a tool to get back Hong Kong and, and we're done with it. Uh, it's, it kind of backed off of that absolute claim, but in practice, it still adheres to that claim that the treaty no longer matters. That in fact, when they wrote a white paper on this, they cited uh, the, uh, they said that the following principles come from China and the principles they identified from the central government were the articles in the treaty but they didn't credit them to the treaty. They credited them to the central government, that this is China's central policy. <clears throat> so that question you raised gets into a murky area of just how much they recognize the Sino-British Joint Declaration anymore. Mm. And rather the, the front line of this and, and under the common law principles that apply in Hong Kong, the basic law is the implementation of the international treaty, okay? And in fact, the treaty stipulated the content of the basic law. So China puts the basic law in the prominent position when confronted with this kind of challenge and then takes the, the uh, right to interpret the basic law as it wants. So it makes it hard to use the treaty. You really, uh, no one has succeeded in using the treaty uh, to determine the meaning of the basic law. It's just not working. Mm -hmm. uh, because China has degraded the status of the treaty so much. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's it. And then the, the, there's the basic law and there's the national security law. And so China, what, what really I think undermines the sort of direction of, of your question, whether uh, lawyers can somehow still make it all work is that structure that I was talking about. It's not just the content of the four crimes, but it's the structure they've, they've created uh, these institutions, the committee and the office that I discussed and made them not subject to judicial review. So the courts uh, really have very little control over what these organizations do. And the national security law and the basic law are both subject to the interpretation by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. And so then the courts are put under pressure. I didn't go far into the Jimmy Lai bail case, but what happened after Jimmy Lai was granted bail is the People's Daily uh, wrote an, uh, uh, an article condemning what the court had done, uh, attacking the judge, uh, and in effect suggesting uh, that if the courts did not get it right, this dangerous criminal, Jimmy Lai, they, that they, they have the right to take him to the mainland to transfer his case to the mainland. They don't come right out and say, we're gonna do it, uh, but the court is under severe pressure in mm -hmm. this context that if they want to keep this case in Hong Kong of this very prominent, very 
popular actually figure in Hong Kong, uh, they're going to have to be very cautious in how they apply this bail uh, article, Article 42 of the National Security Law, uh, which seems to, by its language to create a presumption against uh, bail. Of course, that goes against everything that bail stands for. Bail is, is built around the notion that you're innocent until proven guilty. But this, yeah. the language of this bail statute seems to suggest almost the opposite. And we're going to see what the, how the Court of Final Appeal navigates this. Uh, you like The judges and the Chief Justice, the new Chief Justice, and the old one as well, they just changed recently, have made very clear that we're not influenced by politics. But we're all educated in legal realism. We know mm. that the courts can't, you know, they ignore political pressure at their peril sometimes. Yeah. Uh, how do you preserve as much as you can in Hong Kong? So I, I've, in the book, argued that there's not that much room to protect human rights in this context. I, I even mentioned a few moments ago that they even have a list of judges who are approved. And it's interesting that judges on this list, if they make any statements, there's another article, a separate article says if they make any statements that violate national security, then they will be dismissed from the list. But we know common law judges, they're not politicians. They're not gonna make statements anywhere except in court. So if their rulings in court are ones that China doesn't like, presumably they will get dismissed. Uh, so the pressure on the courts is multi-channel. And therefore, the, the uh, tradition in Hong Kong, Hong Kong's rule of law has always been highly ranked in the world. That tradition is under severe pressure right now. Yeah, it seems like it all does come down to the courts and particularly the way you're, you're analyzing it. Is there any other institution left right now in Hong Kong? I mean, when they, when they created this structure of the basic law incorporate the Bill of Rights and the basic law incorporating the international obligations, they did not create, for example, any kind of, an, of a human rights commission. They right? have so only some, an e equal opportunities commission. Right. And so there some, was a big debate about trying to create a human rights commission at the time and okay. the government at the time rejected it. Right. If they had been one, that might have taken some of the weight off of the courts, right? We might have had more than one institution to be able to play this role. Absent that, it all seems to fall on the courts. And as you say, they're, they're, they're being pressed from different directions. Um, it's hard to see um, how individual judges, but also just the institutions can hold up. But just, is there anything else that you would point us to that we should watch? Any other institutions in Hong Kong, respected um, arbiters uh, of any kind, official or unofficial, that we could look to, that ordinary people could look to for guidance on what the law really says. Because I think it's a time when it, there's, there, there is actually some room for confusion. Um, as you say, some cases are brought and it's not clear, are they under the national security law or not under the national security law? And depending on how you apply the national security law, what does it mean? Um, is there any other voice besides the courts that people can look to for any kind of guidance or even uh, assurance that that someone still has an eye on these international obligations? Well, there have been. I, I'm not sure whether they're surviving. Of course, in the book, as I mentioned earlier, I emphasize the role of civil society in general. Uh, and that is support a role that's supported by the press. So the press, is, there's still a kind of press freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. Press like the courts is feeling more and more of this pressure. And the pressure historically, it's not new, historically has resulted in a lot of self-censorship by the press and the other institution that operates in a similar fashion in responding to these developments is the academy, the universities. Uh, and again, the same similar kind of pressure uh, about uh, you know, risking prosecution, risking dismissal, uh, uh, and so on. So, so this kind, basically, this is why I started by pointing out, it's almost like a textbook case of how to suppress a liberal constitutional system, mm -hmm. because Hong Kong had a very well developed, if basically a fully developed liberal constitutional system, only deficient in the, the level of democracy, but because the, the liberal guarantees uh, were subject of, of a treaty and a basic law. Uh, the 
unlike most countries, they were able to get to fully developed. Uh, it's hard under an authoritarian regime to have a, a fully developed liberal system, but Hong Kong had it in spite of its weak uh, democratic leg. <laughs> and so th that's, that's the problem. So, so all these institutions have existed and have been very important. E even RTHK, Hong Kong has a public radio, public television system, sort of like Britain, the BBC. And so the laws would guarantee its autonomy and so on, but it's now under pressure as well. I mean, I'm a regular contributor uh, on RTHK, in fact, uh, and I keep wondering, you know, how long I'll be able to contribute, uh, whether the views, but these views are, are expressed. So, so are, the, are you expressing these views on RTHK these days? Are you talking about these issues? The yes. National security law? That's all I talk about. That, that's why mm -hmm. I'm here. And so, yes, I talk about these issues. I, I just came, I was on here this past Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. So I talk about that. Uh, I, I also a regular contributor to the South China Morning Post. Uh, and I write about these issues there. And so far these things get in. So it's like this halfway house where you're always sort of testing or, or hoping that, that these views that people can hear and understand what concerns there are when these public actions are taken uh, continue. But like I said, the pressure is there. I mean, the press was long under pressure just from uh, money. I mean, they advertising the Apple Daily the most prominent critic of the government gets no advertising dollars from mainland or mainland affiliated companies. So, so they, those things were already there, but now that publishers arrested, a reporter for RTHK has been arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, so now the, and it, you don't have to arrest a hundred people, you just arrest a couple of people and you create pressure and people wonder where the boundaries are. I, got students uh, over many years. I taught in Hong Kong in all the media. And I get questions from time to time, you know, what can we do? Is there any space uh, left? And so, so that's, those are the institutions that matter in a liberal society. Mm -hmm. The courts, democracy, the press, and the university's education system. Uh, and they're all uh, feeling this pressure. I want to focus just a minute on the education system because there's a question from someone in the audience who says, I'm an American contemplating moving to Hong Kong next year to start, start writing a law PhD dissertation in part about the history of dissent in Hong Kong since the 1940s. And he asks, do you think it would be safe for me to do so in light of the national security law? And do you think that City University or Chinese University of Hong Kong or Hong Kong University would be allowed to admit someone wanting to write such a dissertation in light of the national security law? You know, it's hard to answer that question and, and one that has to be cautious. Uh, uh, it would seem that if all you're doing is, is doing research and then you're going to publish it elsewhere, uh, then there's still a risk, I would add. You know, I didn't mention because of time that the national security law in Hong Kong applies worldwide. So what I'm talking about here right now could be a target of, of the national security law. And so when I heard that there were 30 warrants, we don't know who they are. <laughs> Some of us wonder if we're on the list of people because uh, you're a prominent critic there. Uh, I, it's it's hard to say. Like I said, we don't know the boundaries yet. So a student, I assume the student's writing a dissertation for a university not in Hong Kong and merely seeking to affiliate with a, a local university. I don't know from the question. Uh, but if they're writing that and their dissertation is to be published after they're finished and they've left Hong Kong, then they would uh, presumably face little threat. I mean, right. the long arm of the law could be applied, but it depends on uh, whether, you know, the government wanted to bother with that it would be a good right. question. Now, the question does raise some th a kind of broader issue of concern because many people have expressed concern that the universities may now have more difficulty recruiting faculty mm -hmm. 
uh, because the perception that this, you know, Hong Kong was the greatest place. I taught there for 30 years. It's the greatest place in all of Asia to teach maybe all of the world. It was an open free society in the middle of all the ferment of Asia, everything going on. I was like a kid in a candy store. I could just enjoy the challenges and intellectual uh, things going on around me. I could comment on what was going on across the region and so on. So there was no better job on earth as far as I was concerned. But now I think a lot of people worry that a young, uh, fresh PhD uh, taking a job there, what kinds of constraints are they going to face going forward? Because it seems that China's uh, moving towards more and more control, not less. Uh, and so, so that I think has been a concern that universities may have difficulty uh, re attracting people uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that some people who are there, there's a rich tradition on those universities of people like myself who work in the areas of human rights and constitutionalism and so on, po political science, of commenting on public affairs. Academics are constantly consulted in the media and so on. So that institution of the university as one other important institution is an important institution because the media um, pays attention and, and consults professors. And, mm -hmm. and so people will wonder, will professors be free to speak out against uh, injustice uh, that they see uh, after, you know, in light of the national security law. And because of the vagueness and, and the, you know, we're still at the beginning, we're only like yeah. uh, six months in, uh, seven months in, uh, we don't know yet what yeah. is going to be prohibited and what's going to be permitted. Well, are you as a, uh, someone who is now based in the United States, because you've, you've uh, formally retired from HKU, although you continue to teach as a visiting professor, but you're, you're physically out of Hong Kong at the moment, does that make it possible for you to speak on RTHK about the national security law and to write articles in the South China Morning Post that perhaps your colleagues uh, at HKU would, um, would either feel they shouldn't or you know, just be too worried to, to do the same? Well, I think that, yeah, this has always been a problem with China itself, that academics, like many of them at NYU and other universities in the United States, can feel an obligation to speak out on issues about human rights in China or human rights in now in Hong Kong, uh, because uh, that where you're at, your location makes it safer to do so. Uh, even China's national security law, by the way, the, for the mainland, does not reach globally. It does, it does not prohibit act, uh, speech that is permitted in the country where a person is at speaking. Only the, the Hong Kong national security law does that. Uh, how, how seriously should we take that? Well, a lot of people in this country have been taking it seriously. Professors have worried that, can they teach their classes freely? They're, they're worried because they have mainland students and Hong Kong students uh, in, in their classes and the students will be responding to things. I mean, this last term in Hong Kong, uh, via Zoom, I taught two classes on human rights. And uh, I, I hope, you know, we, my students and I basically just had to forge ahead and address the issues that that subject requires. Uh, but, you know, there have been people express concern that, you know, will their students get into trouble for writing essays and stuff uh, that are critical of the government. Uh, did, you, did you do anything differently last fall in your class than you would have done before? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe a little bit when I, I might occasionally preface something I'm saying uh, to try to encourage the students to think there's, you know, maybe I didn't have to say that before, but I, of course, there are two sides to every issue and so on. And, you know, try to encourage them to consider both sides so that they, it looks more academic and not, you know, uh, they, you know, of course, we all have to do that anyhow, but maybe I would just say that, uh, mm -hmm. make it more explicit. Uh, or if they said something that I, I thought another student might object to, or if there were a student there, I don't, you know, human rights classes don't usually have uh, pro-establishment students. But, but if there were such a thing, I, I, I might respond to their question in a way to uh, generalize it in some way. 
Uh, mm -hmm. but otherwise, no, I taught exactly what I, I, I would Same teach. content, yeah. yeah. Would you go back to Hong Kong um, now? If, 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 when the pandemic is over, <laughs> when we're free to travel again, uh, will you return to Hong Kong to teach in person? I haven't figured that out yet. I, I mm -hmm. honestly don't know. We don't know the reach of this law yet. Mm -hmm. uh, people have told me uh, this, this past term, because I was going to go there, that I shouldn't. And then I was left off the hook by, by the, uh, uh, the COVID, uh, the Zoom, they're teaching on Zoom. And I did that from New York. Uh, so I, I don't, I want to go back to Hong Kong, but I don't know at this stage whether it's safe. I'm also on the board of Hong Kong DC. Uh, and uh, as is Jerry Cohen, your colleague there, and that three of our board members already have warrants against them. So mm -hmm. it's more than just the intellectual content. It's also, it seems that that group, yeah, that yeah. Hong Kong Democracy Council is itself being targeted. Uh, it does nothing but lobby the US government. Uh, mm -hmm. So, which is, you know, that Samuel Chu is one of them. Right. He's got a warrant for his arrest and he's an American citizen. Right, so, but that's the collusion charge. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So, yeah. so those things mean that uh, professors uh, who engage in the kind of work uh, that we do in international law, international human rights, uh, will have to think twice. And then young faculty members that might want to consider, because Hong Kong has always been a great uh, place to go to, to start your career, uh, mm -hmm. may have to think twice as well, I hope. Uh, we get past this, but, but it's, it is a concern. Right. A lot of people are asking questions about what uh, the rest of the world should do. And so in the time we have left, um, I wanted to maybe focus on that. Um, Trump, of course, the Trump administration took, imposed a number of, of sanctions, uh, mostly targeting officials in Hong Kong and officials in China who were deemed to be, you know, who were being held responsible for the national security law. Um, it, it, were those the right steps to take? Were they uh, partial but not sufficient? What would you recommend the Biden administration should do now? Yeah, well, it, it I think it's like an act almost of desperation. There's hardly any choices available. Uh, sanctions, uh, as you know, is, is one tool. Uh, Frankly, if it doesn't reach commercial areas, it may have little impact. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunate. I mean, we've used sanctions in other countries as well, North Korea and so on. Uh, and whether they change the story is hard to say. I think uh, for the Biden administration, the best view right now is that they should restore US multilateral connections uh, I would even like them to pick up again the Trans-Pacific Partnership and get in there. Uh, that it was uh, given Trump's uh, later inclination to put pressure on China over, over Hong Kong uh, and Xinjiang and so on, uh, it, withdrawing from the TPP seemed to be a big mistake because that would give you more ability to put that pressure to create a kind of alliance of countries that could speak to China and encourage change, encourage restraint in their policies. In, in other words, to once in the TPP to use, to try to get the other members of the TPP as a block to impose some kind of trade sanctions against China? Well, it could be that. And the same thing uh, is been discussed with the UK and Europe. Uh, but I think the US squandered so much of its uh, inter inter international capital, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, political capital, that uh, there is not a lot of trust in US, what had been US partners to, to, to operate uh, collectively as a bloc, not to bash China, not to harm China, but to, to focus on these issues that concern people. And it's not just the human rights issues, there are trade issues and technology exchange issues and things also that, that, that collective action could uh, perhaps create a better environment for negotiating or changing uh, policies going forward. Uh, what happens now uh, beyond uh, 
building alliances, which I think uh, the Biden administration is fully on board with and the Trump administration was not. Uh, that, that's kind of one of the major planks of uh, Biden's uh, election campaign to re recover and rebuild U.S. alliances. But, you know, now after Trump, there's a fear that, well, what if the next administration is Donald Trump again? Uh, mm -hmm. Then we'll be back to square one. So this is, has been uh, weakened considerably the strength of U.S. alliances. The other things are important too. The, uh, the British have uh, opened up their borders for immigrants from Hong Kong under the so-called uh, British National Overseas Passport. Uh, those uh, Hong Kongers who hold that, who were people in Hong Kong born before uh, the handover in July of 1997. So Hong, uh, those people, all Hong Kongers, probably three, four million of them, uh, could go to England and settle and become mm -hmm. permanent citizens. So that's one thing that doesn't do much for the youngsters who are out on the street protesting. So there were bills in U.S. Congress to try to uh, address that issue uh, and open up borders. But the Trump administration is uh, kind of hostile to immigration. So one, of course, that's a major thing that Trump uh, uh, was against so trying to trying to close off borders so i think under biden there may be more room uh for uh, you know uh, refugee status or just uh, immigration status out of hong kong hong kong has such a talent pool that countries you know if they're even self-serving could find justification for admitting hong kongers it was interesting just today the, the uh, Bernard Chan, the chairman of the executive council, uh, issued statements and uh, reported in the China Daily that said, well, we don't care if Hong Kongers leave Hong Kong because we'll just replace them with mainlanders. There's a lot of talent on the mainland now, which, of course, is hor horrifying to hear mm -hmm. that Hong Kongers are viewed in this way. Uh, but uh, this immigration is not a solution to the problem, but it, it solves yeah. individual problems of uh, people who fear uh, persecution. Right. Yeah, right. It lets one one, one or or few number of, of persons out of the uh, out of danger zone, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. Could we go back to what you were saying about sanctions not having much impact with that, unless they have commercial um, implication of some kind? Yeah. I mean, Banks and other businesses in Hong Kong are now rather caught between, you know, between the two uh, different governments in terms of they're, they're supposed to enforce U.S. sanctions against uh, Hong Kong and Chinese officials by denying accounts, for example, uh, banking services to those individuals um, under threat of penalty from the U.S. government. At the same time, now they have the national security law. And as you mentioned, some, some of them have been closing down the accounts or freezing the bank accounts of Hong Kong activists on um, presumably under some kind of an argument. I'm not sure exactly what the legal argument is that this money is, is um, implicated in a violation or could be, could be uh, found to be implicated in a violation of the national security law. Of course, it's prior to any kind of court action. So, so the banks uh, most prominently, but also I think some other business actors are caught in the middle. Um, and if more, are you, are you saying that trade sanctions should additionally be applied against Hong Kong and or the mainland in, as a, a means of putting pressure on China? And where would that leave businesses? Yeah, well, that's done already. Of course, when Hong Kong, US government announced that Hong Kong special status was no longer recognized uh, because the autonomy that was promised uh, as a basis for that special uh, trade status for Hong Kong uh, has been lost. Uh, and so th they're already in effect that kind of sanction. Uh, I suppose if they are trying to create pressure, they, they can ratchet it up. Uh, perhaps uh, th there have been problems, uh, I think suggestions that if uh, by the treasury department that uh, businesses that participate in this uh, repression in Hong Kong in some way that uh, whatever assets they have in the United States could be targeted. So mm -hmm. there, there could be ways of putting more pressure on. Uh, and, and what might come out of this is if uh, some degree of sanction is there that business, international businesses that use Hong Kong as a base may start moving off. We know the New York Times is already doing that. It's moved part of its operation into South Korea. Uh, 
uh, because it's reported. So this is a kind of a free press, free speech uh, angle to it. Uh, but then banks are under pressure too to support the national security law on the one hand, uh, and then not get in trouble with the US or UK or any other governments on the other uh, mm -hmm. for doing so. Uh, and so it's they're between a rock and a hard place. And, and what you could imagine, uh, of course, HSBC or Standard Charter aren't going to move out of Hong Kong because that's probably two thirds of their, well, their, their revenue because uh, that they basically uh, are originally Hong Kong based, but uh, some businesses may be moving out. And uh, I think that some of the advocacy, advocacy that we've been seeing from Hong Kongers in exile is to ratchet this up to create pressure uh, that would cause businesses to, to leave Hong Kong. I don't know, I, I'm not taking a position on that myself, but, but I, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I guess I don't fully understand whether it will work. It, it, mm -hmm. The goal is not to impoverish Hong Kong, but to uh, to have, uh, you know, these strict laws uh, pulled back in some way. Now, right. it's interesting that the new chairman of the bar, Paul Harris, just this week taking over, uh, has said that he's uh, going to put he wants to ask and he wants to put pressure on the Hong Kong government to try to amend the national security law. Uh, and that was a really, I thought, a very innovative sort of way of doing it because he's, he's not saying they have to withdraw it. He's just saying that they should amend it. And the reason is so that the extradition arrange, arrangements between Hong Kong uh, and other jurisdictions can be restored. Mm. And so in effect, he's holding out this uh, prize that can be gained that you can resume having extradition treaties with other countries if you make some amendments. But then this is again, a good example of all the pleas that made by Hong Kong people or Hong Kong lawyers or Hong Kong academics are promptly ignored. And so he was promptly attacked in the uh, Beijing newspapers uh, mm -hmm. for uh, you know making these suggestions and and that he was accused of being arrogant and all of these things. Uh, now, it's interesting, the fact that the Hong Kong people, uh, Lawyers Bar Association elected another uh, British national to be the chairman. Uh, well, one of the reasons is because all the Hong Kong local Chinese people who might have run for that position didn't run. So mm -hmm. he ran unopposed. So yeah. that's a hot seat now to be chairman yes. of the bar. So he was deemed by his foreign nationality to be maybe wearing an asbestos coat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The, the, the sanctions issue is interesting in part because, um, because of the role that Hong Kong has played as a financial center for the region. Uh, yeah. And of course, Singapore would dearly love to take over that role. Um, I, I think that would be the main contender. And do, do, you, do you think that that is what's going to ultimately happen? Um, because as you said just now, the, the intent of sanctions and pressure is not actually, there's nobody who actually wants to uh, drive business out of Hong Kong in an affirmative sense as, as a good thing. Nobody's thinking that would be good for Hong Kong, for Hong Kong people. Um, it's not that business itself is at fault here. It, it, I suppose there's an argument that they're complicit in some way uh, to the extent that they enforce these rules, if, for example, companies are, are dismissing their own employees because of suspicion of violations of national security law, if companies start wholesale firing employees whom they determined through internal investigations were protesting, for example, now mm -hmm. you might start to see people actually directly angry at international companies or Hong Kong companies that are doing those things. But at present, they're more seen of as actors who are squeezed in the middle. Right, not necessarily that you want to directly punish them, but you want to use them to have a knock-on effect on the government. Um, so, do you think that ultimately what's just going to happen is they find it impossible to function, answering to two conflicting sets of masters, two conflicting legal regimes, and they move to Singapore? Uh, is that what we can expect? Yeah, it's hard to say, but but they're not so innocent in some ways because the pro-establishment camp in Hong Kong that supports the government and encourages these laws and praises them when they arrive uh, are made up of these business elites. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they they are very much in the game. Uh, they are they might be Hong Kong companies, but they're they operate globally, uh, mm-hmm. and they operate in the United States and the UK and elsewhere. Uh, and so they they have their fingerprints on it, and some have fired people uh, for p- participating in protest, and some have uh, conformed to Beijing's requirements, like Cathay Pacific when it comes to air flights, uh, where the flight attendants who participated in protests could enter China on their flights and do their work. So there's some kinds of pressure. uh, And and I think there's probably a sense that that will increase because companies, when people are arrested and you start seeing the boundaries of this law, uh, those pressures will be there. And and if the companies, for example, HSBC's regional director actually praised the enactment of the national security law. Now today in London in testifying in parliament, the head of HSBC worldwide tried to soft play that a little bit uh, saying, well, we weren't really praising the national security law as such. We were just praising the idea of having more stringent laws to control the public order problem that we had in Hong Kong last year. So they're, they're packaging it and trying to navigate in this space. But I think they also own a bit of it as well, because let's face it, Hong Kong's pro-establishment camp that supports the government and takes care, uh, you know, gets appointed to mainland committees and all these things mm-hmm. are made up of the business elite in Hong Kong. Now, it was interesting when the extradition law was proposed and there was the prospect that some of them who did business somewhere in China and got in trouble with their partners and might be charged with crimes and the extradition law would be applied to them, that some of them actually spoke up against the extradition proposed bill in 2019. Mm-hmm. But well, on the NSF, Chambers of Commerce did. did. Yeah. In the yeah. International Chambers of Commerce were, I think, among the ones who had the most influence, right? That's right. And exactly. And so, but on the NSL, we haven't seen that. I don't know whether, uh, I mean, I interviewed some business elites whose names I, I couldn't disclose in the book. But they they were very nervous about the direction things were. This was at the end of 2019, before the national security law came up. They were worried about a crackdown in Hong Kong. Uh, so it's not really in their interest if Beijing becomes uh, oppressive in Hong Kong. But then they're afraid to speak up, and uh, they will go along as they have for all these many years. What should what should international law firms that are have offices in Hong Kong be doing or saying? Do they have any kind of a professional obligation, in your view, to speak up or to uh, leave? Are they compromised by continuing to work in Hong Kong? Well, yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. That they it's difficult for them. That, that's why in Hong Kong, I should add this as a footnote. The uh, Bar Association has spoken up continuously. It's always stood up for rights whenever there was a threat. Uh, They focus especially on the rule of law element. The Law Society, which is more akin to the international law firms because they, the American lawyers, we do not have a divided bar. And so the role that international law firms play abroad is more like what solicitors do in Hong Kong. But the Law Society in Hong Kong has been much less outspoken. And that's because they rely on clients uh, mm-hmm. that are associated with or from the mainland as the primary source of business and international law firms likewise. So I think the expectation that we will hear much from them uh, is, is not going to be realized, that they, they, they're going to take a very cautious view but they also operate in mainland China. So they, you know, they're gonna go where there's money to be made. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't think we can rely on their voice uh, or their exit from Hong Kong as uh, the kind of pressure that might have an impact. We just had that British QC Queens Council withdraw. He was engaged by the Hong Kong prosecution to lead one of the, some of the national security law prosecutions. And then under pressure, I think, from from home, from from England, he eventually withdrew under criticism. Um, Do you think that he should not have taken 
that um, that engagement? And should other council, international council, take engagement from uh, Hong Kong government entities? I, I think he should not have. I, I'm surprised that he would do so. Uh, it's not clear why he withdrew, because one of the problems under COVID that he would have to go through quarantine mm. and this would involve all kinds of time and, and difficulties. In fact, the bar chair in, a, in an interview, the new bar chair, Paul Harris, mentioned that he thought this was more of a reason. But then he was criticized by the foreign minister uh, in the UK mm -hmm. for taking up this case that the rule that you should take any case uh, didn't really apply for overseas mm -hmm. practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think uh, the government was, why would the government use it? They're actually, it's not the national security case, it's the public order case, unauthorized assembly involving Martin Lee, Jimmy Lai and others. They're not charged under the national security law. It's not even unlawful assembly, it's just unauthorized assembly mm -hmm. in most cases. Uh, some of them, I think, unlawful assembly as well. They have kind of a distinction in Hong Kong's uh, public order law mm. between uh, that, depending on what actions are taken during the assembly. Uh, but uh, if it's not authorized, of course, we know in American law what that means, that you don't have a permit. In Hong Kong, you, it's not actually a permit. It's getting no objection from the police. Uh, so they just had the, the protest, and they're going to be tried soon in early February. I forget the date. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is not even, uh, why would you need a, a, a leading QC from London mm -hmm. to prosecute a public order case involving unauthorized assembly? Well, that's, uh, isn't that the good question? I mean, we couldn't figure out, we don't, of course, know how much money the Hong Kong government was preparing to, to pay. A lot. But, <laughs> presumably a lot. So <laughs> was this an attempt, do you think, to just um, in some way... Um, you know, give it an international imprimatur of a sort that um, that it you know that it does matter to have an international lawyer, international face prosecuting these people to show that internationally this is an acceptable prosecution. I agree that that is exactly my my view of it because they clearly didn't need that, and, and it's also kind of. Uh, unseemly almost this prosecution because of Martin Lee being one of the defendants who's mm -hmm. one of, he's the most senior member of the bar in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and without a doubt one of the most respected uh, uh, barristers in, in all of Hong Kong and probably well known to uh, British barristers and, and uh, all, the, all across the bar. So the idea that you're prosecuting him uh, is probably, I think, something that most people would, would want to avoid. Uh, you know, it's not that he, he's engaged in violence. He spent all of 2019 advocating against violence. It's just that he showed up at a protest. <laughs> so uh, Jimmy Lai is one of the defendants, Margaret Ng, another prominent barrister. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, re problems with this prosecution. But uh, getting a QC from London to handle it uh, was obviously a ploy to, to garner some kind of credibility for the prosecution. Hmm. When, when the Biden administration thinks now about how to handle the Hong Kong question, I think, or for that matter, not just uh, the US, but any government has, has to or, or tends to um, think about it in the context of a whole range of issues on which they want to engage with China. You know, so they'll be thinking about the Xinjiang problem, about Tibet, about Taiwan and its security, about trade, about the desire to, um, to improve the terms of trade with China in the interests of, you know, American workers and so on. I mean, there's a whole range, in other words, of issues, South China Sea, that they'll be thinking about. And there tends to be a sense that, well, you only have so many cards you can play, or you only have a limited amount of leverage. And if you use your leverage on issue A, you have less leverage on issue B. Um, is this the right way to think about how any government, including our, our own, should, should be addressing or, or approaching uh, Hong Kong and thinking about how to uh, sort of stand, make a stand, or take a position on upholding the rights uh, and the international laws that we help put into place 
should we be thinking about it in those terms? Is there another way of framing it so that we're not just stuck on this question of, oh, but if I act now for Hong Kong, I have fewer chips to play when it comes time for Taiwan or for trade? Well, it's probably inevitable that that thought has to enter their mind. This is why I think there's a, a kind of consensus behind and support for our Biden administration uh, expanding its multilateral influence and thereby working with others uh, mm -hmm. to derive and not look appear to be just a very partisan effort by Americans, but a kind of effort to uphold global standards uh, to elevate the concerns that are being raised uh, above uh, that kind of narrow interest of the United States. Uh, to, and in effect then uh, it gets cast as China if it wants to be a leading a player in the, on the international scene, then these are expectations that everybody shares. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think then you try to, I mean, this whole thing in Xinjiang, uh, where the US government has already called it genocide, <laughs> getting others on board for that kind of accusation might uh, enable it to sort of get above water, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, be viewed as just some uh, US uh, you know, Cold War with China. So, mm -hmm. so that I suppose has to be the, the path is to try to elevate that. And in that context, then Hong Kong stands out. I mean, I even started the book by comparing Hong Kong to New York and London, that Hong Kong is not just any city in the world. It is one of the major centers of finance and culture and things uh, that has a, a, you know, so when you envision what's happening there. It's not just about US interest or anyone else's interest. It's, it's about the world's interest in losing this major, major city, probably the major financial and cultural center of Asia. So that I think also it's, it's how it's presented uh, that mm -hmm. can be relevant also to this because it's, it's not, you know, North Korea is a horrible case, but it gets less attention even though the conditions are worse because its role in the world is, is much, much less. Mm -hmm. But Hong Kong is, is a, something I think everyone values in a distinct way. So it's a good case to make. Mm -hmm. and, and so finding a way to get that argument above water so that it's not just a partisan uh, viewed as a self-interested US attempt to use, as China will say, use human rights uh, as a tool against us. Mm -hmm. So it's not the United States using human rights to bash China, as you say, it's the United States and the entire community of liberal democracies saying um, that we uphold certain values everywhere, including and importantly in, in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not directed against China. It's for the people of Hong Kong, but it's also for the world that we care right. about these values. Exactly. And we are upholding these because we want the world to stay focused on the path of uh, the, maintaining these values everywhere. We can't exactly. afford to lose Hong Kong. Yeah, I think that's what you have to do. I mean, let's face it, all, all, any attack is going to face uh, you know, resistance from China, but China does want to be in the game. It wants to, that's why it's holding an Olympics. The mm -hmm. last time it held an Olympics, Tibet was the hot issue. <laughs> right. And, and uh, you know, that, that was an opportunity that actually encouraged China to meet with the Tibetans. It didn't go very far, but they at least they sat down and had that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, people are actually talking about the Olympics again as being a vehicle to press China to to you know speak to speak with people and to engage on these issues and not simply dismiss them, which is the current path. And I think the Trump administration approach encouraged that path is, is very, I see we run out of time, it's very interesting that a lot of people in Hong Kong and, and dissidents in China supported Trump administration because they said a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were constantly uh, uh, making statements and so on. But it, the trick is not to just make statements, but to try to get results. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. This is this has been a really terrific discussion. I apologize to those whose questions we didn't get to. There were, there were a lot of really excellent questions as we anticipated, but we'll have to leave it here. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Michael, for, for the book and for speaking with us today. Thank you.